Another thing that we see common in both of these diseases is dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and we see dysregulation of the hypothalamic thyroid axis as well. So in this particular cartoon, what we're seeing is both the hippocampal region, all right, area responsible for memory processing uh, in the central nervous system, has an inhibitory uh, impact in terms of the uh, hypothalamic area, which is responsible for production of corticotropin releasing factor, which then interacts with the pituitary gland, uh, causing the release of adrenal corticotropin hormone, and then uh, travels through the bloodstream down to the adrenal glands to cause the release of glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids are critical for normal metabolic function. They're critical for uh, dealing with inflammatory processes in the body. And there's a circadian rhythm to them, and if that circadian rhythm is disrupted, our lives get disrupted. So part of what happens if we see too little uh, cortisol being secreted in the morning, we're exhausted. We can't get out of bed. We can't function. If we see too much cortisol being secreted in the evening, we can't get to sleep. So the regulation, the normal regulation of this, uh, this axis is extremely important in terms of maintenance of health. Indeed, what happens in problems with both chronic pain and depression, this axis gets dysregulated, all right? And so there's a there's a problem with the signaling processing in terms of what happens between the hippocampus and the hypothalamic nuclei in the brain. Also, it happens an overinfluence of the amygdala, which is responsible for emotional processing in the brain. Uh, and that effect, in terms, causes a dysregulation. Now, there's a misperception, people think, in terms of adrenal problems, okay, uh, in terms of low cortisol levels, that the problem's in the periphery at the level of the adrenal gland. That's not where the problem is. The problem's in the central nervous system. And the problem is what we see is damage to hippocampal neurons, reduced replenishment of hippocampal neurons, neuro neurogenesis, uh, and the end result is a loss of sensitivity to glucocorticoids coming in, and that is what causes the dysregulation. The problem is not peripheral. The problem's not in the adrenal gland. The problem's in the central nervous system. Same thing goes, by the way, for the uh, thyroid axis as well, and we see dysregulation of thyroid uh, hormones both in uh, depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and in chronic pain situations. So there are common neuroendocrine pathways that are being disrupted uh, in both of these diseases. Indeed, there's a significant overlap in terms of the, the brain centers that are involved in both these diseases as well. The prefrontal cortex, for instance, is involved in executive functioning, and certainly executive functioning is severely impaired uh, in people who have um, chronic depressive disorders. But we also see loss of mass and dysfunction occurring through SPECT studies and functional MRI studies in virtually all of these brain centers in both of these diseases. Okay? So we now see that we've got common neuroendocrinologic issues going on. We have common uh, neurotransmission issues going on in these diseases, and we have common and anatomic issues going on uh, with both these uh, disease processes. There also is common genetic vulnerabilities, and indeed in individuals who suffer with both chronic pain and chronic depression, we see a tendency toward a hyperinflammatory state in these individuals and the genes that cause the expression of these states. So we've got common neurobiology for both these diseases, and neuroanatomy, neuroendocrinology, neuroimmunology, and neurotransmitters, all right? There's a lot going on. But what's the basis of all of this? To date, all of our focus has been on almost what I would refer to as the epiphenomena. That is the, the anatomy, the neurotransmitters, and, we're be, and now we're looking at this concept of inflammation, but what is inflammation? Okay? Inflammation is a process where there's cellular damage, where there's a response of the body system to that, and the response is geared toward protecting the body from further damage and repair of the body in those conditions. In the central nervous system, what mitigates or what, uh, what uh, regulates the occurrence of inflammation in the central nervous system are little creatures called microglia. They're part of the, uh, the glial system. And the microglia uh, are truly remarkable little structures that exist at really what is the mind-body interface. And we're going to go into some depth in terms of what goes on now, but microglia in this particular cartoon talks about damage that occurs at the neuron, information 
That is, chemicals as re released as a result of damage to the neuron get sent out, the microglia become activated, the microglia themselves then start to secrete substances which both serve to protect and repair the nervous system, but also, uh, when dysregulated, set up a chronic inflammatory process in the nervous system which then becomes neurodegenerative. So, let's talk about neuroglia first and just give you an overview of what this is. So, neuroglia are the connective tissue of the central nervous system, the, the structure on which everything is built. They insulate neurons for, by the, creating myelin, a sheath surrounding uh, the nerves. They supply nutrients and oxygens to the neurons. They modulate neurotransmission. They destroy pathogens in the, in the uh, central nervous system. They create the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, and they form the uh, blood-brain barrier and the uh, cerebral spinal fluid barrier uh, in the central nervous system. Now, for the longest time, the thought was that there were about 100 billion neurons in the system and about 10 times uh, that many glia cells in the nervous system. If somebody had, that calculation was based on upscaling from our understanding of lower species uh, and assuming that uh, we had similar ratios, or because we had bigger brains, we had uh, different ratios. And so we walked around touting those numbers until about 2009 when somebody actually decided to do the study. Now, one of the problems with those numbers is if you've got 100 billion uh, neurons and 10 times that many glia, what you end up with is a 45 kilogram brain. It's a little bit bigger than our 1.5 kilogram brains that we actually have. So the real numbers here are about 85 billion plus minus uh, of neurons in the central nervous system, uh, and, uh, and this is in the brain itself, not including the spine, and uh, about 84 billion uh, glia cells in the system. And the distribution of that glia is not even throughout the system. So neurons in the cerebral cortex, which is the major processing area of the brains, actually only constitute about 19% of the total mass of the cerebral cortex which is 80% of the mass of the brain. The rest of that is glia cells. So for the longest time, our belief that glia cells are nothing more than connective tissue in the central nervous system was grossly uh, misplaced. The fact of the matter is glia play a very essential role in neuroprocessing and neurotransmitting, and we'll talk about that now. So if you look at glia, basically they're made up of uh, three different major types, the macroglia, are the oligodendrocytes, which constitute about 75% of the glia. They're responsible for making uh, the myelin sheaths uh, that insulate the nerves from each other. The astrocytes constitute about 17% uh, of the macroglia cells that are in the, uh, of the glia, rather, that are in the uh, central nervous system. Uh, the astrocytes have a wide range of functions, uh, some of which is structural, some of which is the creation of the blood-brain barrier, some of which is uh, cleaning up and making sure that the neurotransmitters that are in the synaptic cleft don't remain there and overstimulate the nerves. And so it, ha it has a very specific regulatory function in terms of neurotransmission uh, on the neurotransmitter level. And then we have the microglia, uh, which constitute about 6.5% of all the glia cells in the body. The microglia have, are amazing little creatures, all right? They are resonant cells of the uh, brain involved in regulatory processes critical for development, maintenance of normal neuronal uh, environment, injury, and repair. They are the electricians of the central nervous system. They are part of the innate immune system of the central nervous system. Now, microglia are not hooked up to the circuitry of the, of the central nervous system. They exist twixt and tween the neurons. And in fact, they sit in a sensile state where they're actually monitoring the region around them, and they're trimming uh, uh, ciescent uh, uh, dendrites uh, and making sure that the uh, anatomy of the area stays functional. All right, Anything getting old, anything not getting used, gets uh, taken down uh, by the microglia in their resting state. So they're not quite resting. They're actually being sentinel and uh, looking around the area and making sure that they keep things active. In the, um, they're exceptionally active and in an amoeboid state in a newborn uh, because what's happening is we have a huge turnover of, uh, of brain cells going on, neurons going on during that time, developmental time. And the microglia are part of making sure that everything stays connected the way it's supposed to connect and doesn't connect in ways it's not supposed to connect. 
And so they're running around cleaning up extra uh, synaptic connections and making sure that everything's aligned the way it should be.